could please stand to your feet and turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Once again, we want to welcome you. I want to take a moment to shout out everyone that's serving today. We have two services, which means double the work behind the scenes. And so I want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone that's contributing to facilitate this, right, to make this happen. It doesn't happen by osmosis from the parking lot and our safety team to our sanctuary servants and our hallway hosts to our audio visual team, our music team, our children's church staff, our children's church staff, our children's church staff. They're pouring into the life of our kids and making sure they understand the gospel to um, the people who clean the facility and behind the scenes logistics administration. Um, and if I missed anybody, just know that we're grateful for the small things and the large things. And I hope that you can feel the intentionality and the work that's going to make sure that you can experience the love of God in an atmosphere like this. So once again, thank you to all those who serve. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, for when we were still without strength, in due time. Somebody say at the right time. If you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. Okay, now if you're saved, you can remember when you were lost. You can remember how crazy you were, what the circumstance of the situation was, how desperate, how ignorant you were, and at just the right time. It clicked. The gospel became alive to you. At just the right time, somebody prayed for you. At just the right time, your heart finally submitted. And it's made all the difference. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's who we were before Jesus. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners. See, we didn't clean our act up and then go to God and God say, okay, you're good now. No, we were in our mess. We were still in our drama. We were still addicted to the substance. We were still addicted to the relationship. We were still doing all types of crazy things. And God still said, I choose you. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, I want to preach today for a few moments from the topic, why did Christ have to die? Why did Christ have to die? You may be seated. Holy Spirit, you're in this place. We yield to what you are doing. Father, we thank you for the resurrection power. Now, as we understand what it took to get to the resurrection, may we have a resurrected mindset about what it means to live for you and represent you. And Father, may someone who is far from you come to you through the cross, through the work of the Holy Spirit and the work that Christ has accomplished. And may we continue to God to represent you in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today we have arrived on what most consider the holiest day on the Christian calendar, Easter Sunday. We call it Resurrection Sunday. And today we celebrate the reality that Jesus is risen. Of course, there is no resurrection without his death. We celebrate the fact that Jesus conquered death and the grave. We celebrate the fact that our Savior is alive, that he's not just a quote-unquote religious leader. There have been religious leaders of various movements in the earth, and they have all died, and they're still in the grave. They can't find his body because we believe that he is risen. This is not figurative, although we can take some figurative language and use it in terms of resurrection. But I need you to understand that Jesus is a historical person who lived and died a historical life, 
who died physically and rose from the dead physically. That's the God that we serve. According to the scripture, Jesus not only died, he died the worst possible death on the cross. It's what we call crucifixion. In ancient times, the crucifixion was the worst way for a person to die. It was a Roman method of the death penalty. Listen to me, the crucifixion was so torturous that Rome did not even utilize it on its own citizens. And the scripture indicates that Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. This is torture that literally lasts for hours. We didn't have a Good Friday service, so let me tell you about Good Friday. Crucifixion began with scourging. The person was stripped naked, tied to a post, and then flogged. Not just with a simple whip. They had something called a cat of nine tails, and it had multiple whips on it, and they would put shards of bone and shrapnel on it, so every single whip would pull a bit of the penalized person's flesh from their back and from their skin. This lashing caused lacerations and damaged muscles and collapsed lungs. And then after that, the scripture records that the Roman soldiers put a scarlet robe on Jesus. He had claimed to be the king of the Jews, and so they mocked him by taking a crown of thorns and pressing it upon his head. They mocked him and they spat on him and they struck him, bruised and bloodied. Jesus then was required to carry his cross to his place of execution. Now, scholars have some different perspectives. Some think that he carried his entire cross. Others think that he carried his cross beam. To me, it doesn't matter because at that point, he's losing blood. He's been beaten for over an hour, and he has to carry a solid wood beam. If it's the entire cross, it was 300 pounds. If it was just the cross beam, five feet across, it was at least 100 pounds. And he had to walk 2,000 feet is what we call Via Dolorosa, Latin for the way of suffering. He had to carry his own cross to a hill called Calvary. And then they had to hang Jesus. You've heard about the nail prints in his hands. When you see that word hand, it extends all the way to his wrist. Most scholars believe that they put the nails in his wrist. They had to drive the nail through the bones of the wrist, severing the median nerve, paralyzing his hands and causing excruciating pain. And he hung there. And what really killed him was suffocation. Eventually his thigh muscles would fail, which transferred his body weight to his arms and he would suffocate and he died. So here's the question I want to pose to you today. Out of all the ways that God could reconcile Humanity, why would he choose the cross? I want you to think for me or think with me for just a second. Imagine that you were God. You ain't, but imagine that you were. You know, nowadays people say we are gods and I'm this and that. Brother, my sister, where were you when the world was formed? Where were you when the stars were slung into the sky? Where were you? talking about we gods. Let me see you raise yourself up from the dead, talking about we gods. Imagine for a second that you are responsible for the redemption of mankind, and there is a problem, sin. Think of all the different ways you could handle it. Think about your ideal superhero. Why would you choose the most humiliating form of death to rescue the creation which you placed in the earth. This is the perplexing question. This is why people on the outside looking in don't understand Easter. They laugh at us because they think it's about Easter bunnies and Easter egg hunts. But no, no, no. The scripture says that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's hard to understand until it hits your heart first. Then you realize the significance of what Jesus has done. Why would God choose such a gory, problematic way to crucify the one whom he claimed to be his only begotten son on the cross. Well, in order for you to understand the cross, you've got to understand Judaism, from which Christianity was birthed, and you've got to understand a concept called the Day of Atonement. For Christians, Easter is the holiest day of the Christian calendar. For the Jews, the holiest day is the Day of Atonement. 
Throughout scripture, we see God choosing to work his plan through his chosen people, the Jews in the Old Testament, and he had a way with them. In his economy, there were certain things that he required Israel to do to demonstrate that they belonged to him. We know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything was good, created mankind in his image and in his likeness, breathed the breath of life into man, said, you can take and have fun with all of this, but this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat of it, you shall surely die. They disobeyed God. Now sin entered into the picture. Sin is not just what you do. Sin is something that is within you. They pass it on to every generation after them. So when you read the Bible, you see people wilding out. You see people with problems. You see people committing sin against others and committing sin against God. The problem with sin is not just what you do. The problem with sin is the nature that is within you because you have a propensity to do things against God's word and his will, to do things against yourself and to do things against other people. And humanity left unchecked would destroy itself. Some people want to know, why is there so much drama in the world? Why are there wars and rumors of wars? Why do people rape people? Why do people kill people? The Christian answer is sin. Something ain't right. And it's within us. And it would be one thing if you could say, well, Lord, just take out all the evil people in the world. But the Christian revelation is that there is evil within us. Which is why we need mercy. Because it's always easy to say what them doing and what they doing. But where's the honest person that can say what I is doing? What I am doing for those of you who speak proper grammar and English and you are educated. So we see early on in the scripture that there is a sin problem. And God chooses through his chosen people of Israel to demonstrate a method to deal with their sins. And so we see in the Old Testament a sacrificial system. You got to understand why there's a sacrificial system. Tell me this, what's the most important thing coursing through your body right now? blood. You have the air, the breath of life that God placed in you, but then there is blood circulating through your system. Heaven forbid you get into an accident and you start bleeding very quickly. They have to stop your bleeding because in the blood there is life. Blood represents life in the Hebraic mindset. So God created a system to acknowledge the sins of the people Because he told Adam, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die. And death entered into the picture. The relationship with God died at that moment. They were separated from paradise, Eden. They were kicked out. And now people had to live and die. And then there's an eternal separation that had to be dealt with. So we see God setting up a system to say, you know what? In order for my people to be right with me, something has to be accounted for this sin that's in the world. And so they had a sacrificial system. And in Old Testament times, the high priest would enter into the holies of holies on one day to atone for the sins of all of Israel. There was a tabernacle and there was an outer court and an inner court. And then eventually there was this place called the holies of holies, the tabernacle, then eventually the temple. This was important. This was their sacred space. And you had priests who were required to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people so people could be declared right with God. The high priest had to enter into the holies of holies. And the goal was atonement to reconcile man back to God. Now, when you see the word atonement, when you break it down in terms of its English etymology, it really speaks to reconciliation, at one meant, that we are reconciled with God. But when you really get into the Hebraic concept of it, it it really speaks of removing something, removing the blemish, removing the sins, making reparation for what has been wrong, atonement. So inside of the Holy of Holies, there was a box, an ornate box. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And there were three things in the box called the Ark of the Covenant. Number one, there were the Ten Commandments. This represented the word of God. There was a pot of manna which reminded people of the provision of God. Then there was a rod of Aaron which was a symbol of God's given leadership through the priesthood. On the top of this wooden box, there were angels facing each other. The lid was made of gold and this was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat represented Yahweh's throne on earth. They believed at that time that the throne of God was 
on that mercy seat, that it was in that Ark of the Covenant. And in the Holy of Holies, that's where the presence of God would be. And the high priest was the only one ceremonially qualified to go in. And there would be a series of uh, sacrifices that would happen, rituals that would happen within there. But, but the Day of Atonement wasn't complete until the priest found two goats. The high priest would then leave the holies of holies after sprinkling blood on the mercy seat and, and, and he would find two goats. The first goat was sacrifice. It was slain and that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. The animal's blood was shed so that the people's blood would not have to be shed. That was the purpose of the first goat that was slain. But the second goat is what we call a scapegoat. So after slaying the first goat, the high priest would then find the second goat and he would lay hands on that goat and confess the sins and the rebellion of the people. He would lay hands on that goat and then he would pray to God and confess the fact that the children of Israel had not done all that they were supposed to do and confess the sin and the rebellion of the people. Then he would release that goat into the wilderness, representing how the goat, the scapegoat, would carry the sins of the people away for a year until they came back again to have to do the Day of Atonement once more. This concept of taking something that belongs to one person and crediting it to another is what we call imputation. Imputation. At that moment, the priest would take the sins of the people and credit it to the sinless goat. And it was ceremoniously taking the sins of all of Israel and imputing it crediting it to the goat. The goat hadn't done anything. It was the people. But in that moment, the goat had to absorb the punishment that belonged to the people. So they would release the goat in the wilderness symbolically, saying that their sins now have been forgotten. But on the calendar, once again, the Day of Atonement had to happen time and time again. Now, the problem was that people kept on sinning beyond the Day of Atonement. The people kept on sinning. Then on top of that, the priests had their issues and their problems. They could not keep their responsibilities properly. And every once in a while, that goat would come back. <laughs> the goat would wander back and the people were reminded of their sins that were supposed to be gone. I'm here to speak to those of you who find yourself in a similar challenge to the children of Israel, that Sometimes the things that we thought we buried have a way of wandering back to you. The Apostle Paul said, there is a law within me. The things that I should do, I don't do. When I want to do good, evil is all around me. Things I'm not supposed to do, I find myself doing. And he comes to the conclusion that the only way to overcome that existence is by placing his faith in Christ alone. So let's go back to the question, why did Jesus have to die? The answer is to serve as the final scapegoat. The, the, the final scapegoat. You should know him as the lamb and the goat. The greatest of all time. The final scapegoat. The unblemished lamb who died for our sins. The book of Hebrews declares that Jesus is the better high priest and the better sacrifice. Twofold, Jesus was sinless, so he was perfectly qualified to offer the sacrifice in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Before the high priest could go into the holies of holies, he had to be right. They would tie a rope around his foot just in case he was not consecrated because if he dropped dead in the presence of the Lord, nobody else was qualified to go get him. So the best they could do is pull him out with the rope. Jesus was sinless, so he was perfectly qualified to go in and out of the holies of holies. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, he passed through the heavens. He was in the holy place with God, and he wrapped himself in a robe of flesh and came down to serve us. And he was tempted like all of us, yet he did not sin. So he was qualified to offer the sacrifice, but Jesus is so bad, I'm going to offer the sacrifice, and I'm going to be the sacrifice. He was sinless, so he offered his life on behalf of men. 
He's the only one who could mediate with God because he was holy. Have you ever had somebody step to you and they just weren't on your level? Like, I'm not talking to you. I'm a CEO. CEOs talk to CEOs. Adults talk to adults. I, I don't need to negotiate with the kids. I need to negotiate with someone who has a, a level of authority. And, and when it comes to holiness, the holy can only negotiate with the holy. So, 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 so God, the Father, chooses to send his son Jesus. Jesus agrees and comes into the earth. It's what we call the hypostatic union, that he was 100% man and 100% God. Why is this important? Because he felt every single slap, every single whip, every single pierce in his side from them poking at him and the nails and he felt all of that. He did not switch into some robotic mode where now the pain was dulled because he took his divinity and blocked himself from the realities of humanity. No, he felt all of that because he was 100% human and 100% divine and he became the final scapegoat. He absorbed the sins of the world on the cross and he offered his own life. Romans 5 and 6, where we started for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. I'm so grateful for friends and people I have in my life. And, And we all have people who would say, you know what, I would take a bullet for you. And I believe them. But when that gun is, when it's popping off, I mean, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but it's one thing to have the sentiment and then there's the actual practice. And, and, I, and I know, parents, you would take a bullet for your kids. You wouldn't think about it because those are your children. I get that. I love some of y'all. But then I'm thinking about my kids and I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. I love you, but I have to hesitate for a moment. <laughs> For scarcely a righteous man will one even die. Perhaps for a good man, you would consider it. But we definitely ain't dying for our enemies. We'll pray for them. (laughs) But here's the thing. The scripture says that Christ died for us and we were theologically, we were in terms of justice, enemies of God. And Jesus still died for us, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, here's the clincher. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justification means to declare someone righteous before God. So here we are. With the evidence of sin in our life, here we are still sinners, here we are still ungodly, and Christ becomes the scapegoat. The punishment that should have been for us was imputed to him. And although we should have been slain, although we should have been separated from God forever, Jesus took our punishment. And now we are declared righteous even though technically we're not. We are declared righteous, although technically we're not. A good lawyer can make arguments in the courtroom. Uh, Who am I talking to? And by understanding the way the law works, you might be technically wrong, but legally right. And so when we're in our sins, technically, we ain't holy. Don't sit there and look at me like you don't ever have some thoughts. And see, see, sometimes the problem with the church, we like to talk about what we used to do, but we don't want to talk about what we're still doing. We want to talk about how he saved us back in 02, how he saved us back in 2006 back in 2013, but we, we don't talk about how he rescued us from sin the other day. We, we don't want to talk about the thoughts that race through our mind, the times when we find ourselves like that goat coming back, 
certain things that we thought we had dominion up, but yet somehow it comes back, which is why we need the righteousness of God because if it was just based on our effort, we could not stand, but we have been declared righteous even with our issues and our problems, and now the righteousness of God is superimposed over our life, and we have been rescued from the wrath of God. Wrath is the punitive outworking of God's righteous indignation at sin. If somebody harms your child, it is naturally instinctive for you to want to get justice. Righteous indignation. They did what to my child? We cry for justice, not realizing that we have been spared from justice, which is the reality of the Christian life, that the wrath was poured out towards us, but Jesus steps in and receives the punishment that had our name on it. So Christ dies so that we can be justified. He took our punishment. It's what we call the substitutionary atonement. Jesus Christ took the full punishment of what? We deserved for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin. For he, God the Father, made him, Christ the Son, who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus imputation. The high priest took the sins of the people and transferred it to the goat. The father takes the sin of the people and transfers it to the goat with a capital G. Christ received our sin. He became our sins so that we can become righteous. And now the righteousness of Christ is now imputed to us because of what he has done. When we were without due strength, Christ died for the ungodly. The debt of our sin was so great that we could never pay the price to satisfy the wrath of God. But thank God for the gift. Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Wages represent what you earn. So our sin earns us death. But the gift of God, something that we could not pay for, something that we receive, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Our debt becomes his debt. Why did Jesus have to die the way that he did to bring atonement, to make us at one with the Father again? And now we can go boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy when we need it. As the worship team comes, in the holies of holies, only the high priest could go through if the high priest was right. Normal people couldn't access the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. They were not qualified. But when you read the scripture, the narrative of Jesus dying on the cross, there was a moment where the veil was ripped in the temple from the top down. The temple had curtains. We're not talking about the curtains you go get from Home Goods. You know, the curtains that are barely blocking the light on your window. These were big, thick curtains that could not be ripped with human hands. And the scripture indicates that when Jesus gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was ripped from the top down, signifying how now we didn't have to go through a man in the earth to commune with the Father. We can now go to him directly because Jesus became that final high priest and that final sacrifice. And now we can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy when we need it. You can come boldly even though you still wrestle with sin. The righteousness of Christ overcomes the unrighteousness in you. And for all those who submit, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus died so that you can be set free. Jesus died so that sin can be addressed once and for all. And our hope is now in him. So as we stand and as we worship, 
I want you to remember how personal this sacrifice has become for those of us who place our trust in Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We were, those of us who are saved, in that whosoever category. But one day we made a commitment. We made a decision. We surrendered to the message of the gospel, and we believed in this man named Jesus. And we said, Lord, save us. And that blood that was shed now covers our sins. When you look at me, you don't see a perfect person. Christians are not better than anybody else. We're just better off because we have the gift of salvation.